I wanted to continue the story of the connection of differential forms and topology a little bit. We're not going to um, get too advanced about this. But the big question that's, that's kind of left hanging by what we did with the Poincaré lemma is um, that was a very special case when we were in all of Rn and there was nothing taken out. Um, and so it wasn't a particularly topologically interesting space. And we had the situation that all closed forms were exact. Well, what about cases where that's not true? Um, and of course, that's the st what that, that is, is the start of what's called um, Duram theory, where you look at exactly how the topology of a space influences this, this question of how many closed forms are there that aren't exact. Um, and I just wanted to introduce you to basically the natural generalizations of the examples that were in those uh, topology one and topology two handouts that um, I originally developed to be done by vector fields, and then I showed how they translate nicely into differential forms. So let's look at Rn, and R is the radial vector field. And so EI is just uh, you know the analog of IJK, just the um, standard basis vector, vector fields. And some Xi EI is going to be a vector field that just takes a position, x1 through xn, and produces the vector that's exactly the same components as the coordinates of the point. So it's the standard radial vector field. And then alpha, uh, so let's, let's draw a picture of that. Like in R2, that goes out like this. It grows as it goes out. It's linear. And what we're going to do is we're going to take alpha to be, we're going to start with dv, which is an n form on Rn. That's just dx1 wedged through dxn. And then I take the interior product of uh, that with the radial vector field. Um, so that's going to still be something that's radially symmetric. dv, the volume form, is definitely symmetrical uh, under rotation. It's kind of a, um, a honeycomb that it, in any, at any location, it just gives you the area. For example, in uh, R2, dv is something that if you think of it as acting on a parallelogram, dv just gives the area. And that is invariant under rotation. And um, so IR dv is, should be invariant under rotation. And then to get the scaling right, we're going to divide that by r to the nth power. And um, another way to say that is we take the vector field r, divide it by r to the n, and we'll see why. And then take the tilde. Remember the tilde, that's a very natural way of creating the um, a one form, and then we star it to get an n minus one form. And we've talked already about how that's the natural kind of thing if we're if we're interested in, for example, taking the divergence of something. Um, if we want to think think of the divergence of that vector field, that's exactly what we're going to do. Now, because we've divided by r to the n, this is not going to be defined at the origin, and so this is going to be something that blows up as an n form at the origin, and that's why it could be it could possibly be a closed form that's not exact because it's not defined on all of r n we've punctured the space. And we've seen that that is, has a very profound topological effect. OK, so the first thing to do is to show that uh, this is actually a closed form, that d alpha is equal to 0. And this is referring to a problem set I don't th really think I've covered in the video, so I'll go ahead and do this. Um, we know already there's this connection, d alpha, that this is d of star of tilde of something d of this guy. And we already know that d star of tilde of a vector field, that re replicates the divergence, oops, I need an equals, of the vector field you did. But what you get is not a function, of course. d of an n minus 1 form is a n form. But this was the connection. It's really star of div, that guy, which is really just div times dv. Because star of a, of a scalar function, remember, is just multiplied by the volume form. OK, so that's something really we've done before. And now, either way you want to do it, um, with completely in the differential form terminology or in terms of the, uh, the divergence, we can calculate that this actually does actually have vanishing divergence, this vector field, or equivalently, this form is closed. But let's do it with the differential form technology, since that's the point of these videos. d alpha is going to be, well, let's see. I'm taking this interior product, and that's a sum, so that's going to be linear. Um, well, but let's let's just do it out slowly. We've got one over r to the n, so we're going to have to deal with that in a minute. 
and then we've got the I sub R, oops, not capital R, but a bold R of DV. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and um, translate that I sub R first. We could work on a couple of parts of this first, but the I sub R is then going to be is going to be a sum over all the dimensions of x i and then i e sub i of dv. And that's going to be something we know how to deal with. Okay. D of, so this, I'm just going to let this hang out, this scalar hang out here. The sum is actually going to go out all the way out to here. And then this is going to be, so there's going to be an x sub i and then i e i d v d v remember is d x one through d x n and then this just takes out the i and so that's going to be d x one wedge uh, let me go ahead and make this bigger wedge d x and it's the d x i we're going to hat that in a minute oh, and I need a wedge in front of that. Mm. I didn't don't didn't have this pre-prepared because I didn't think it's going to be a super hard calculation. So the dxi we're going to hat that to indicate that that's not really there. Okay, we have a hat. Okay. Alrighty. So now we have to deal with d of a function times this form. Well, remember d of an n minus one form, an almost top form, is pretty easy, and that's why it replicates the divergence because we only need the derivative of this with respect to xi. So we're going to have sum over i as well. OK, so now we're going to get the partial uh, with respect to xi of um, xi over rn. So this would be a double sum, because we'd have the sum over all these components, and then the d would be giving us a, a bigger sum. But it's not going to be a double sum, because the uh, this has to match this guy for in order to get anything non-zero. Oh, and I totally forgot the sign here. Remember, the i e i is going to give us a minus one to the i minus one. Because if it was a dx one, it wouldn't have a sign. But it's dx i has to switch past i minus one things to get in the right right place. Well, the nice thing here is that minus one to the i minus one is then going to cancel. When I put a dxi right here, and then I wedge it with the rest of the stuff that's already in place, well, that's going to put that dxi right back where it is, and it's going to cancel. So it's really just going to be dx1 wedge through dxn. And I really should put another wedge to make it symmetrical. OK, so that's just dv. Ta-da. So that's really replicating the calculation that this is the divergence, in case you were wondering why, in case you had forgotten from an earlier video. So now I really do actually have to calculate this out using the, oh, I guess I want the dv too. OK, so we're just going to take this guy. And now this is going to be, with the quotient rule, we're going to get r to the 2n on the bottom. Oh, that's not an r sub n. Sorry about that. Uh, that needs to be an r to the n. I bet that looked weird to you guys, huh? OK, so d by dxi of xi is just 1. And then that's times r to the n left alone minus x sub i, and then we need d by dxi of r to the n. Well, that's going to be n times r to the n minus 1 times d r dxi. And then a very easy calculation. Remember, r is the square root of the sum of the squares. Very easy calculation shows that this is exactly just x, whoa, that's just xi over r. I'm not going to do that one for you. OK. And let's see what that simplifies to. We know what it's supposed to simplify to. It's supposed to go away. So if we put this over common denominator, that becomes an r to the n plus 1. Um, and then that just becomes an xi. And then this gets another power. So I'm just going to put that other power. Oops of r all down in here, OK? 
So let's see what we've got. We've got, um, oh, and yeah. Should be good. Okay, so now the sum in the i is the crucial thing here. The sum over i of this stuff, there's no i left in here. And so we're just going to get n, because there's n coordinates. So we're just going to get n r to the n plus 1. This is all over r to the 2n plus 1. I could cancel those out, but there's no point. And then the sum in the i here, the sum of xi times xi. Hey, sum of xi squared, that's r squared. And there's already an n in here from the derivative, and then an r to the n minus 1. And look at that. These are the same on the top. There's a dv there, but it's going to be die, going to die. OK. So this power n was had to exactly match the dimension of the space so that this thing coming from a derivative of r to the n matches the fact that when I sum up a bunch of things that don't depend on i, I get n copies of that sum, and then it, it dies. OK. So this is indeed a closed form. Just by direct calculation, d alpha equals 0. This is a really big deal that this vector field, r over r to the n, is divergence free, or equivalently that this alpha is a closed one form. But I claim that it is not exact. So why is that? Okay, I'll sh show the start of that, but then um, I'll leave the rest of it to another video. The claim is that we, we can show that it's not exact by showing that its integral over a closed uh, submanifold is not equal to 0. Remember, if the form is exact and the submanifold is closed, then the integral is 0 by Stokes' theorem. And we can show explicitly, at least in the small dimensions, that this is not equal to 0. OK. So let's look at this. Let's go to the picture here. Um, for example, in R2, we're taking the one sphere, and other, otherwise called the circle, and we're going to integrate the form. Now, what was the form that we're getting? The form was take the, the kind of honeycomb pattern from the two form an interior product with the radial vector field. Well, what do we get left over? Then that's going to be something that looks like this. And we've sort of killed the radial lines in the honeycomb, and we've got this guy. Well, that's the d theta that we've seen already. It's not really d of something, because theta isn't really a function on the circle, but it's convenient to call it the d theta. Okay, so let's look at the, these three cases first of all. n equals 1, that's really degenerate. That's the real line. And alpha here is just 1 over r i r dx. Okay, well that's the r vector field. Okay, so that's just going to be 1 over r r is just x e1 or x i and so that's going to be and r is just absolute value of x times x and then so i e1 dx1 and that's just nothing and so i just get x over x i get the scalar function it's it's a zero form x over absolute value of x okay and then how do i determine that that's not a an exact form on this space, well, I just integrate it over this two sphere, or this, sorry, this zero sphere. So that's a very, very degenerate case. This guy is the zero sphere inside of R1. And the claim is, what, what, was, what was the analog here of an exact form? It's not really, I shouldn't use the word exact, really. Um, the claim is that this is not going to be um, a constant function. Well, it's clearly not a constant function. It's plus or minus 1. It's plus 1 here and minus 1 here. Okay. And you might wonder, wait a minute. I thought that we're going to be adding these two numbers, and these do cancel. But remember, if I'm thinking of S, so S0 as a, uh, the boundary of an interval, for example, this is counted with a plus sign. This is counted with a minus sign. So you ended up getting a plus 1, plus 1, so that's not equal to 0. It's kind of a maybe too degenerate case to see that, show the real idea, but it actually works. Okay, So we get plus 1, plus 1, and that's not equal to 0. So it gets more interesting and more geometric when you get n equals 2. That's up to this case. Okay, And now here, 
uh, alpha is going to be 1 over, now this is r squared, and now this is i sub r, and that's the vector field r of dv. Okay, so let's write that out. Got an r squared on the bottom, and then this is the interior product with x i y j, or x e1 y e2. So this is going to be x times the interior product. Let's use this notation. Uh, I guess I'll use subscripts. I could use x and y because it's just good, just good old friendly r2, but let's just be consistent. x2 i e2. Okay, so, and this is all uh, doing operating on dv. So that eats dv, and then that eats dv. Okay, and so that's equal to, kind of typesetting it weirdly, but that's okay. So we've got an r squared on the bottom, not on the top. And ie1 dv, of course, is just dx2, and then it's got an x1 in front of it. And then ie2 dv, it has to skip over, and so we get a minus, and we get minus x2 dx1. We've seen this before. Um, and this is just the rotating standard vortex vector field turned into a one form. This is, uh, if you call it V, and then we tilde that thing. Let's make it bold. So if we have V being the vortex vector field, this is exactly take that vortex vector field and take the, uh, the tilde of that thing. Well, what's the integral? Um, let's start a new display box. The integral over the unit circle of alpha, well, I just need to pull it back using the standard parameterization of the unit circle, which is just cosine t sine t. And so that's going to be the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And then I just have to express everything here in terms of cosine t and sine t. Well, r squared is just going to be 1, because it's the unit circle. x1 is cosine t, and then I get d of sine t, minus x2 is sine t, and I get d, oops, d of cosine t, not cosine, cosine. Okay, and so what is that? So here's just a really good example of just not trying to convert into a vector field language or anything, just straight up using differential forms. And the point is, once you get a hang of it, it's easier. You just plug in what all the coordinates are in terms of your parameterization and let, let the magic of the d work for you. d of sine t is just cosine t dt. So I'm just going to cosine t dt. And d of cosine t is minus sine t dt, just as if you were in BC calculus. OK, and there's a common factor of dt, and certainly being over 1 is not particularly necessary. So let's actually just cut that out and then actually put it all in parentheses. And of course, you can see where this is going, and you should be able to predict where this is going. It's cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. And ta-da, you get the integral over an interval in the real line of the simplest possible thing that's not 0. And of course, that's equal to 2 pi, Okay, which is the length of the unit circle. This is a calculation that um, we've seen many, many, many times, at least in our class, and even in the videos, this has kind of come up over and over again. Okay, but it's nice to do it uh, repeatedly. Okay, so the next one would be integrating the three-dimensional analog of this. That's a two-form. Alpha will be a two-form there over S2 using spherical coordinates. And you can probably guess, if this is two, this was two, this was two pi, you might be able to guess what geometric quantity is liable to come out when we do it for the two sphere. Um, and that's what I'm a I ask readers to do this in, in this one, is to guess what do we think is going to happen. And remember, the main thing for the topology is just to verify this actually is never 0. And we're not going to do it in general for n, because uh, it gets a little bit complicated. But we'll be able to convince ourselves that it's at least not 0.